Everybody, welcome. I, we see 32 people in here. Thank you so much for joining us. I know, um, you know, we, we might be a little zoomed out at this point, but it's, uh, you know, we're certainly very grateful uh, to see such great attendance from, uh, from our database, something that, uh, something that we love to see. Now, just to go over a quick little house rule, guys, um, uh, following, we ask that you can please mute uh, while Mark is giving his presentation. Now, if you, a question comes to mind that you'd like to have addressed uh, before we kind of part ways here, uh, what I recommend you do is either post it in the chat or perhaps raise your hand. And when Mark is ready, we'll kind of open the floor and, um, and kind of get through those questions. So just keep that in mind, guys, if uh, you'd be so kind. Um, that said, we'd like to formally welcome everybody for joining us this morning. I'd like to uh, introduce um, today's presenting partner, which is BDO Chartered Accountants and Advisors. Um, that said, I'd like to call on um, U40 OG, as well as, uh, as of course, um, a board of director, Charles Wall, who will be making our introduction this morning. Thanks, John Anthony. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm excited. I'm really excited for today. Uh, we have an amazing speaker in Mark Pedipa. Uh, we're very fortunate and grateful to have someone with his level of integrity, experience, and, and wisdom join us. Uh, he delivered an incredible presentation for our under 40 group a couple years ago on servant leadership. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to his pre presentation today. So thank you uh, very much, Mark, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, a bit of background about Mark. He's the CEO of the Mark Pedipa Group, and he's going to be sharing with us how to scale the human side of our businesses. Uh, he'll help us to learn how to become an effective leader and build great teams. Uh, he's very passionate about the skills needed to develop your team, so you can take uh, so that they can take care of your customers. He also believes a great opportunity exists for leaders to take ownership in improving mental health in our country by better serving others. Uh, before starting his own business last year, Mark was the president at uh, Dunsire Developments, where he was responsible for achieving the strategic operating goals uh, for the company, and most importantly, uh, leading and growing the team with a new era-based strategic plan that's anchored in servant leadership philosophies, which you'll hear more, you'll hear more about today. Uh, before Dunsire, Mark had a 20-year career uh, in leadership roles with companies such as Telus Mobility, uh, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, The Printing House, and, and Fusion Homes. And he, he truly lives by philosophy and set of principles that uh, enriches the lives of others and individuals, builds better organizations, and ultimately creates uh, a more just and caring world. Uh, he's excited to announce that he's releasing his first book, uh, Congratulations, Mark, uh, on servant leadership called the 50-year-old millennial, he doesn't look anything like a 50-year-old, but uh, it's a great book title. The 50-year-old millennial, The Leadership Gap and How to Close It, and it's coming March 2021. Uh, I personally, I don't know anyone that's more passionate about leadership than Mark, and I'm sure we're going to get a ton of value from him today and be able to apply the principles into like our lives and, and businesses. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Mark Pedipa. It's all yours, Mark. Uh, feel free to share your screen. Awesome. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I, I will take it. Um, I, should, uh, I should share that as the CEO of the Mark Pettipaw Group, I am uh, also the accountant, the customer service, the sales professional. Uh, so the title might sound bigger than it is. It's one employee in, a, in an entrepreneurial business, but uh, hopefully not for long. Um, Thanks for having me back. I, I really enjoyed uh, a couple of years ago down by the water in Hamilton, uh, the venue we were at. And, and when Cindy and I were talking about maybe what I could talk about today to add some value, you know, I mentioned I was doing this book and uh, that I want to prepare all my keynotes around the content in the book. And then we said, okay, well, that's great because part of the book is about what do you do when you lead? Uh, but what I wanted to add to today's is give you a little insight about some things you can look for to grow your career. Right, because I've been lucky enough to work for people who really invested in the things I talk about in my book, like servant leadership. Um, and I just lucked out. I worked for Bob Hunters and Lisa Larders and Jackie Foos that you read about in the book. And 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 uh, 
you know, not everybody has that. You know, you may be working in a different scenario or, or, or working in a different type of organization that's too small to invest in training right now. So what I'd like to do in this presentation to give you some tips how to take control of your own self-development and career, help you get to where you want to go. And then on the other side, how do you lead people when you get on the other end? The other thing we wanted to talk about to make this a little different than a couple of years ago is, is some personal stories about my journey that, that are also in the book that I hope resonate with you. Um, because we all go through, John Anthony and I were joking about this before the call. Um, if life was smooth, we all want the manual on, on how to make that happen and, and, and nothing come up in life. Um, and, I, and I've gone through a, rough, a couple rough years, but when I tell my story, you're going to be like, I've gone through rougher than that. Um, and the point is, you got to keep battling through. And what I want to do is give you some tips and tricks on how to do that as well as we talk about how you will lead in the future. So let me, uh, let me skip right into the presentation here. So on the right of this picture, you will see a picture of me and a handsome gentleman beside me with a guitar. That's my brother, Steve. My, I'm the youngest of five. Uh, Steve passed away a year and a half ago of a massive heart attack. Um, that none of us were ex expecting. The people that you see below, Steve and myself, are my mom and dad. My mom passed away about eight years ago, a uh, massive heart attack that none of us were expecting. And my dad passed away four months before Steve. <clears throat> so if you talk about the last two years of my life, um, boy, that was, that was kind of some punches there of, of losing my brother unexpectedly and then my father. Um, but I learned a lot from losing my mother seven years before that, six years before that. And so what I want to do is bring that story um, into your career, believe it or not. And I'll explain how it all kind of ties together. But, you know, the, the biggest thing I've learned as I've grown my career, um, and sometimes you have to kind of look backwards to understand it, and that's what I want to share, is you've got to look at the full context of life. Because as much as we want to turn off work when we get home, um, it doesn't happen. And as much as we don't want the influences of home life to come into work, it doesn't happen. And so what you need to do is be aware of these things. And what I'm going to focus on are the positives in your life that can impact your career. So the first thing I always talk about is knowing your DNA. So this is the how do you grow your career part of the presentation before we go to the how do you lead. So for me, um, I am absolutely, as Charles mentioned, extremely passionate about servant leadership. And there's two reasons for that. One, I've worked for servant leaders who didn't even know they were servant leaders. So, you know, Bob Hunter at MLSE, um, the guy who gave me the opportunity to open BMO Field in Toronto when I can't build anything, all of a sudden I've got to build a soccer stadium and I'm employee number one, uh, believed in me and served. And he taught me and he closed all those gaps because he saw I was willing. And so I've been lucky enough to see those lessons and I've been lucky enough to pay attention. So when you have a leader that you can grasp um, a hold of and, and they want to help you grow, be open to that feedback. Let it stretch you into areas you've never been before. Be uncomfortable. Let them guide you. And so part of my leadership DNA comes from all those leaders. And so what I share there is pick up all the things that you want to pick up from great leaders. And here's the other side. If you got, not now, of course, if you've had a shitty boss, pay attention to what they do that you don't like and make sure you never repeat it. Understand the impact it has on you as a professional and your mental health and make that part of your DNA to not repeat. I've probably learned as many lessons about leadership from bad leaders, they've only had a couple, um, as I have from good leaders. So, so be aware that that's in your DNA um, and be cognizant of it because emotion shows up when you're dealing with people and it's really coming from all those experiences, both positive and negative. The other one is know your family DNA. And what I mean by that is, you know, when I look back and I look at servant leadership, now that my mom and dad are gone, I realize there's, there's two key characteristics in my leadership style. One is my mom was maritime. My mom was the life of the friggin' party. There was not enough Alexander Keys around in good times. Um, and she was amazing. And, and, she, and, you know, Simon Sinek, for anybody who follows Simon Sinek, wrote a book called um, Eaters Lead Eaters. <laughs> leaders eat last right and he has uh start with why and and my mom was that everybody like literally she ate last she made sure everybody was fed everybody was happy she'd make fun of herself so the group would have a chuckle and that was her servant side 
And, and I saw that and I saw it made people comfortable. She put people at ease so they can enjoy life. And what you have to do as a leader is you have to kind of put people at ease so they can learn and grow and there has to be trust. My dad, man, my dad was a military guy. And when my dad said, you do this, we did it. All mom had to say was, I'm telling dad when he gets home and holy sugar, man, we shook and the behavior stopped. And so when I look at my leadership path, I look at mom and dad now and I go, ah, I get it 20 years later. I'm really disciplined about strategic planning. I'm disciplined about my leadership process and one-on-ones and PDSs and coaching during the game and performance review. And, and that comes from the discipline of dad. And mom is where I'm like, open conversation, inquiry versus advocacy, finding out where you come from so I can better help you close those gaps and then really celebrating all your wins. And so the lesson I'd like to share with you is realize that earlier and bring it to the forefront. It took me a long time to realize mom and dad were my first two servant leaders. And it was that simple. Create that environment and have a process. And, and that was my DNA. So as you're growing your career, look for that. Um, and then I, you know, learn from tough times. And, and again, I reference back to the conversation John Anthony and I were having before. Man, people would look at my scenario right now and go, oh, he's writing a book and he started his own business. And God, he's been the president of Dunsire and the VP of Fusion. And he opened BMO Field and he ran Telus Mobility. Man, this guy's got it going on. F no, it's been tough, man. I lost some of the most important people in my life along the way. Um, and I've been aspiring to be a president of a company for the longest time because I wanted to show you could lead a company through servant leadership and deliver results because that was always the excuse. I can't trust my people. I can't open up this dialogue because if I do, the numbers are going to drop. And it's quite the reverse. A servant leadership style grows people's behaviors and people's behaviors generate the result for your customer. And so I had been on this 20 year journey to get there. And I got there and I was working for a guy by the name of Sean Keeper at Dunsire. He'd been running his own company for 10 years. And he recruited me in to say, I can't scale because I don't have that skill. I'm great at land. I can put deals together, but I need someone who can come in and run a company. And so there I was for a year. I built my own executive team. We put in these trainings and the pandemic hit. Um, and I got on my soapbox and I said to Sean, listen, man, before you let one member of this team go, it's me first. You ran your own company for 10 years. You don't need to pay a president over 200 grand a year and cost four people their job or three people their job. Well, sure enough, the next day, uh, Sean took me up on that and said, okay, well, then you're the first guy I got to put on the sidelines and, and, and I plan to get you back and who knows how long this is going to last. Um, and it still hurt. It felt like being fired. I sat in my office quite uh, transparently, my wife came in and I bawled. I, I cried. I was like, I asked for this, but what are we going to do? Like, you know, I am not your stereotypical CEO that sometimes we assume too much of that I've got a mansion, a cottage, four cars. No, I'm a divorced and remarried dad with four kids paying for two mortgages, not because I own two houses, just to be clear, because of my commitments to my children. They're still a part of my life from my previous marriage. Um, and and it hurt financially and emotionally. But here's where I'm you know, gonna take the story to pause it. I had no choice, right? So I've, I've always thought about this consulting thing, but I've always been afraid. The full-time paycheck, I'm a president, it's a, it's a high paying role and I can keep, I can, I can pay the bills, I can keep food on the table. We, we can continue to have the caravan <laughs> and a Kia, right? <laughs> and life can go on. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and so I was always risk adverse the pandemic kicked my ass off the fence. I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a paycheck. I had to start my own company. I waited for about three months. It wasn't working. Sean wasn't back yet. And I called him and said, I gotta go. I gotta go do this thing on my own. If the pandemic doesn't hit, I never do it. I'm a president of companies till probably the day I retire. And that's not to suggest I won't do that one day if the Montreal Canadiens come call calling. Um, but, I wouldn't have done it. And, and the lesson is like, there's blessings in difficult times. You know, there was appreciation of who my family was. Um, there was appreciation for my skills when I had to get pushed off the fence. 
Um, and there was toughness in me that I didn't know existed. Um, and I only got there because I had to. And so what I challenge you on is, is look at those difficult times, like the ones we're going in now, while you're laying low, build your skill set. Start dreaming about those things you've always wanted to do. Understand the gap and close it. So if you want to be a VP and you're a director now and you're sitting at home, call your VP and say, what am I missing to get your role one day? What does that look like? And take ownership in that and start closing that gap because the time right now is a blessing. The pandemic, if you look at it the right way, with I, I can't believe I'm saying this because I, I, I understand you all know what I mean, but it is a little bit of a blessing with time. Um, you know, we're losing people, businesses are suffering, people are dying, people are getting sick. I get that, and, and I'm not underplaying that. But look at the silver lining. Now you got time to work on yourself. Now you got time to reinvent those skills. I played 3,427 street hockey games with my children that I never would have got in my life without this pandemic. That's life and it's right in front of you. I had the opportunity to build my own website, start an e-commerce platform, write a book. And by write a book, hire a writer to help me write a book for anyone who's seen my social media posts where there's a spelling mistake every four words. But I, but I took the approach after I took that punch in the stomach to get up and said, okay, got time, what do I wanna do? And so approach your career that way. Watch one less Netflix show and, and maybe download a podcast. Um, maybe read a book, maybe take a course. It's all there in front of you. Um, and then lastly, if you love what you do, learning is easy. So, you know, the picture of Steve above, my brother was an extremely talented musician. If you've ever gone to old Montreal and now two years past, cause he's been gone um, and saw a guy playing his acoustic guitar in Jacques Cartier square in old Montreal, playing old Elvis tunes and Beatle tunes and today's pop hits on that acoustic guitar, you have seen my brother. He's, he's literally famous without being famous. Everyone says, oh, I saw this guy. And yeah, that was Steve. But he never had a job in his life. That was his job, music. And, we, and he struggled. He lived in a bachelor apartment in Montreal. He couldn't make ends meet barely every winter because, you know, you go from outside gigs to trying to play bars and the money isn't the same. And, and he's scratching and clawing to, to make life work. Um, and I had a conversation with him, oddly enough, before he died, not knowing clearly any of us that he was about to pass away. And I, and I asked him if he wanted to borrow a few bucks so I could help him get through the winter. And he's like, I've been doing this for 55 years. Well, that's an exaggeration because he was 56. He didn't do it when he was one. Um, but I've been doing it for about 45, 46 years. And he said, Marky, I'll make it work. He goes, I love what I'm doing. And I missed it. Like, I missed it. Like, it's not about the money. And of course we have to pay bills. Don't get me wrong, but you won't be happy if you're not doing what you love and going for it. And Steve chased his entire career for a record label. He loved music and he wasn't going to take a day job to get away from that. Um, and his measurement of life was doing what he loved. And, and, and he passed a happy man um, way too soon, way unexpected. Um, so if you can find that and chase that love, which is quite frankly, what inspired me to do this when, when the pandemic hit, I'm like, so what? Maybe it doesn't work. I'm freaking going for it because that's the part I like to do. I like to train people. I like to teach people how to lead. I like to show them how to do sales behaviors. I like to teach them how to do a proper strategic plan so they can grow their, screw it, I'm doing it. And you know what? Worst case scenario, I'll go back into the work world. So if you love what you do, learning the skills you don't have is easy because it becomes a passionate about getting better. It's like my brother learning a new song on the guitar or writing an original song. For me, God, I've never built my own website. I've had marketing teams who are really talented that have done it or agencies. Now I got to do this thing by myself on GoDaddy. I'm having fun. I'll figure it out. So don't lose sight of that. That'll probably be the longest slide of this presentation. Um, be the dumbest person in the room. It's like seriously, and let people know it. If you're not, find a different room. If you wanna grow your career and you already have the skills, you're not challenging yourself. Comfort zones are terrible for personal development. So if you are an accountant, as an example, and maybe one day you want to be the VP of finance, or maybe you don't. Maybe you just want to be a damn good accountant and have your CPA. Start taking those courses of the skills you don't know, even if you're afraid. 
because you will not grow if you keep doing the same thing over and over again. And I know what I normally get feedback from people is, yeah, well, my company only lets me do the same thing over and over again. There's not an opportunity for me to do something different. Go ask for lateral challenges or go at home and learn the skill yourself. The employee development, it's ideally you're working for responsible organizations that have a program to give you that, but if, that, if they don't, it's a crutch. You can still go develop those skills on your own. Um, identify your gaps and ask for help. So when I uh, got the opportunity with BMO Field, I was a retail guy my entire career. I got brought into Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment to do consumer products and sell t-shirts for the Leafs and Raptors and Toronto, F well, before Toronto FC, the Marlies. And my boss was a guy by the name of Bob Hunter, who was the executive vice president of MLSC, and he was accountable for the entire operations of the Air Canada Center at the time. And I kept telling him I wanted his job. Like I was adamant, like, no, no, I, yeah, I do retail, but, but I can do what you do. I, I can oversee food and beverage. I can oversee security. I can oversee ticket operations. I can figure out overseeing the guys who build the ice. I can do all that. I have a transferable skill set. I know how to lead, so give it to me. And he finally just got tired of it. And he said, you don't know how to do food and beverage. You don't know how to book a live event and concert. You don't know how to work with the promoter to get the live event produced. You don't know how ice is made. You don't even know how we convert to a basketball court. And you have no idea, even though you think you do, how ticket operations work. But if you're willing to learn, I'll teach you one by one. I asked for that learning opportunity before it presented itself. Bob Hunter wasn't going anywhere at that time. Remember, MLSE doesn't have Toronto FC or BMO Field. I know I'm probably not getting his job anytime soon, but I got to start learning to get there if I truly want to get there. And as a leader, he gave me that opportunity and we lucked out that BMO Field came along. Toronto FC would never have been in Toronto if the Toronto Argonauts didn't leave the deal for a national soccer stadium for the under 20 worlds in 2007. And the Argos were going to take over the stadium and they walked away and MLSC jumped in and said, okay, we'll do it. We'll bring a, TF, we'll bring a, a major league soccer team here, but let's bring the stadium over to exhibition place. And the deal got done where I'm going with this long winded story is because I was developing for a year before it happened, it showed up and Bob's like, I can't run both buildings, but they're both going to report to me. Okay, Mark, you're going to open BMO Field. All this learning you've been doing, let's find out. And I would like to say successfully, when it was still turf and only suites on one side and an old rickety aluminum stadium that was new, looked old, uh, and bolts were still falling from the sky. Thank God none hit anybody. Um, and beers were still served in cans in ice buckets. Um, we got through and we did a good job. Um, the live event side, we were only able to get one concert with Genesis. I was never able to book another one because um, the cost to do a concert at Exhibition Place is three times the cost to do a concert at the Air Canada Centre based on the union agreements. That's my excuse and I'm sticking with it. But the learning opportunity was already in place. The functional opportunity had to show up and it did. So thank thankfully, if I wouldn't have put in that work and Bob wouldn't have invested in me, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Um, find a leader who you trust to take you to the room and turn on the light. That's Bob. So, so Bob just saw this guy's not going to get off my back. So I'm either going to call him out quickly because he won't learn the skill or he's going to start learning and I have a next in line. So he brought me to that room and he turned on the light of awareness, right? When I mentioned earlier, you don't know food and beverage. You don't know. It's ice. You freeze it. No problem. Now nah, it's way more complicated than that, you know? And, and, some could argue that they don't do a good job in Toronto because they haven't won a cup since 19. But anyway, sidebar, sidebar, go Habs go. I know I'm losing the crowd. Everybody dropped off. I get it. Um, the one thing that will surprise you, even people you think may not be approachable, um, if you ask, they'll help. Um, people love to help people. And I know that's not everybody. Um, but I think you'll find a lot of, I love it when people call me for advice. I'm going to be completely honest. The ego side of me goes, hey, I helped them. They wouldn't have got there without me. Um, that feels good. That releases my endorphin. Like, I'm, I'm a happy camper that I can help you. And there's more of those people out there than you think. So ask for help. Again, this is all on the upside of, of you getting promoted and learning and building your skills. Um, I'm going to talk on the back half of this presentation that we're going to trans transition to now about specifics if you're a leader today and how you can better lead your people. And when you get there, a process that you can put in place. And that's the main portion of my book is 
I do 25% of little storytelling like I just did and, and 75% of, let me backtrack. The thing that frustrates me about the knock on servant leadership and it's earned is Simon Sinek has tremendous books. John Maxwell talks about the five levels of leadership. They're all philosophical and science-based, right? So they give you studies, and the, but no one tells you that you can do it. And so in this book, I give you five very simple processes with behaviors that support it, that if you want to serve, go do these things and do them well. None of them are rocket science. You've probably heard of all five, but I put it all into a process. What I, the reason I'm sharing that is you have to start doing that for yourself now. If you want to grow your career, you have to start to ask for these things. If your leader isn't giving them to you, self-development, close the gap online, reach out to a mentor, find someone who will give you that development. It's tougher. It's best if your leader gives it to you, but I know not all leaders are ready for servant leadership here. You know, I, I'm working with a PR firm on the book and he's like, well, what's the audience? I'm like, one, I want people who are going to be leaders and they want to learn the right way. Two, I want leaders who are good people and really care. They just don't know how to do this stuff. So they're a little intimidated. Like, what does it all mean? It's huggy, huggy. I'm not going to be able to measure it in the business. I want to educate them on why it's good for their organization and how they can measure it. And I said, there's an audience I don't want. He goes, well, what is that? I, said, I don't want the asshole who doesn't care. Right? And sadly, sadly, um, they're kind of in the majority for my I've lucked out, I've had really great leaders, but as I look around, they're kind of in the majority. And so what I'm trying to do for you here is say, okay, if you've got that, it's not over for you. You can still develop your own career and here's how. So one, ask for regular one-on-ones. So whether your leader has time for once a week or once a month, get some communication forum where you have their undivided attention for 30 minutes. And the goal of those is to really find out um, where you're not hitting their expectations or where they're not understanding what you're doing and where you need support and guidance to allow you to be more successful. Take ownership of those and have them update meetings if they're not going to give them to you. Build your own, and again, word of caution on the first one, you still may work for a leader who says, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. Ask them when they have time. Is it 7.30 on Monday once a month? Is it 7.30 at night on a Zoom call? once a month. And if they still tell you you have no time, then again, you got to seek that development online. Um, let me take an example. You're a, you're a drafter and you don't have Reddit and, and you're looking for Reddit guidance. Well, there's forums. There's places you can go and ask questions. You can find out the learning and development to close that skill if your management of, of drafting doesn't give you that regular guidance. But look for it in your leader first. Give them the opportunity. Next is one you can absolutely do on your own. Build your own PDS. A PDS is a personal development strategy. Ask for support. If not, go do it on your own. So I'm Mark Petipa. I want to be a C. So actually, let me give you the perfect example. I'm a VP at Fusion Homes. I'm working for Lee Piccoli. I'm accountable for sales, after sales service, and IT. But man, I want to be a president. And, and, and I want to be a president, not because I want the title. I want to be a president because of all this stuff I'm talking about. I want to show Lee I can scale his company and grow it. And, and I want to do it the right way so we can have long-term success because everyone's leading this way all the way through the organization. I know I don't know finance. I know I don't know land development. I, I certainly know I don't know construction. Like I can't put a nail in the wall, right? And so what I need to do is identify those gaps, Here's how you can do it on your own. You can challenge yourself to identify the gaps you don't have to either be better at your role today or get to the next stop. Identify them and seek the resource online if you have a leader who won't give it to you. But ideally, if you've got a leader who's approachable, who isn't just doing this, just isn't doing the discipline, come to them and say, hey, I wanna keep learning. I wanna be ready. I wanna be a next in line or I wanna add more value to the organization. I need to learn these skills. Is there anything you guys can do to can support me in either time or cost to do that? A lot of organizations will, hey, thanks for breaking it up, bringing it up. Why don't you go research it, find a course, come back and give us a budget. And you tell them it's $300. And if you're doing a good job, they're like, hey, there's a winner. They're going to grow. Let's give them the 300 bucks. Let's get them off to that course. The worst thing they're going to do is say no. And you got to find a financial, financially viable option online that works for you at the time. And then ask your teammates for feedback during the game. And I, I tell this story a lot about, because uh, of my exposure at MLSE, imagine if, 
Nick Nurse, in the run that they went on to win a world championship, came to the timeouts when they were playing Golden State and they were down by six, looked at the scoreboard and said, we're down six, boys, got to get us eight points. Not what they do. They go in and they look at, they watch the game, they look at the behaviors that are happening, and Nick will pull them aside and say, hey, Pascal, come on now. you got to buckle down down low. You're not moving your feet quick enough. And that's why Clay is getting right by you every single time. So move those feet, shuffle, and guys, defensively, come on now, we talked about our transition game. Let's go. we got to move the ball up the court faster. And, and they're all behaviors that they're teaching. Here's where I, I, I take that to the next level. The most valuable feedback that's happening live are the guys talking on the court during the game. Nick Nurse only, Nick Nurse only gets them during the timeout. But Kawhi is giving friggin' Pascal crap all the way up and down the court if he's not doing what he needs them. And, and uh, Kyle's calling plays all the way up and down the court. And he's, he's walking over and he's saying, listen, you're not getting yourself open and you're gonna, or you're not kicking the ball back to me for the open three-pointer. They're, 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 they're way too tight down low. They're covering us too well. we got to get the ball back outside. The teammates are helping each other raise their game. Ask your teammates for feedback. If you have a leader who's not giving you the guidance and support that you need, I bet you you have a peer that will be honest with you. OK, and so that's how you take a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, ownership in your own career. Ideally, bring these all to your leader. If you've got someone who's open, if not, take ownership yourself. <clears throat> so let me talk to you about the waterfall. So let's assume you do all those things and or you're now in a position of leadership. You made it. Not really. <laughs> OK, so now you owe all this stuff to the team you lead. So why servant leadership? First of all, what does it mean? Servant leadership means you come to work every day knowing and assuming that you have a willing team. And if they're not being successful, it's because they have a knowledge gap. And you are going to own that as a leader. You're going to help them close that gap. Everything you do, one-on-ones, personal development strategies, coaching in the sales center when you're watching your team sell, watching them build a house on site, whatever that looks like, sitting in a marketing meeting when they're preparing a a launch campaign for a new community. You are there to help them close the learning gaps. That's what servant leadership means. Think about that. If, if that's your mission every day you go to work is to make people better at what they do, how does that not drive the success of your organization? So it's tremendous for employee development. The best way to build next in line so you can scale and grow is to improve everybody's skill set before they get into the next role. You're taking the manager to director before the director position ever shows up and you're preparing them for that. And here's the beauty. If you've got a great work culture, guess what the easiest way to screw that up is? Promote from the outside and bring in an asshole. Why not develop the skills with someone who fits the culture, who's a willing participant doing really good at their job today and wants to grow? The only thing holding them back is experience and learning opportunity. It's tremendous for employee development. It's how the best organizations scale. Um, it's fantastic for business because you are looking at your business with every team member at least once a week. Think about that. You're sitting with every person who reports to them and you're going through their key performance indicators, the behaviors that cause them. You're recognizing stuff they do really well so they repeat the behavior. You're closing the gaps on where they're falling down. And you, from a half an hour meeting with six or seven people who report to you every week, are on top of your business and can change the result. We wanna do a new promotion. We want a new cost cutting opportunity. We wanna lay some people off to develop the, the bottom line. The bottom line happens in every single one of those in, uh, interactions with your team. Fantastic for the customer. The amount of times my, my after sales, so we went through a little journey at Fusion. I'll use them as an example. Uh, you know, we grew rapidly and we won six Tarion Awards out of eight years. And then if anyone on the outside looking in would say, well, geez, Fusion hasn't won one in three or four years. Like what happened to their quality? And if you looked at Google reviews, it wasn't going too well for us. We got too big too fast. We had a culture that encouraged the employees to tell us. And so we, like most organizations who grow rapidly, we fell down a little bit. But guess what? And every one one, my PCs would come to me and say, we don't know how to do flat roofs. That project in Kitchener is a disaster. We're on our seventh unit with a leak. That gets to the VP of sales and client services. I go to Lee's office and say, you got to talk to Rob in construction. These flat roofs keep leaking and our customers are going frigging nuts. You're not going to like the CSAT surveys. 
that is tremendous for the customer because their feedback of unfortunately yelling on the phone at a poor PC who's just the middle person gets through the organization. If you don't have that in place, it dies on the phone. The PC goes, it's not like I can tell my boss anyways. Hang up the phone and say, yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. And the problem never gets solved. Then the negative referral starts. And then you got a real hard time selling flat roof townhomes in Kitchener. So it's really good for the customer. And the major reason I do all of this, and I know this is going to sound soapbox-ish, um, where do we spend half our life? We spend it at work. Imagine you're in an abusive relationship at work because they exist. Is that not going to carry over when you go home? Are you not going to be in the right mindset when you go home to be a father or a mother or a partner or a friend? It's inevitable. If we can change the way we lead and convince these owners that it's good for business and inspire them to change the way they lead, and we are happier at work, do we not create a happier, healthier world? Problem we have is there's not enough of us out there. You guys are next. If you're not in it now, you're next. What are you gonna do to change that condition for your kids when they enter the workforce? Because believe it or not, you're that middle chain, you're next. If you're shitty leaders, you're doing that to somebody who's going to be your kid's age at one point. And so we have to create that change faster. I truly believe we can change mental health in Canada by changing mental health in the workplace because we all go home. I remember as a kid, my dad coming home from work in, you know, he was a military guy. And when he retired out of the military after 25 years, he worked at a company called Pratt & Whitney Canada. Um, they did engines for, for large manufacturers. Um, and then he'd work at the sergeant's mess, which is where the military guys go to have their beers on the weekend in St. Hubert, Quebec, about 10 minutes from our house. And I remember him coming home some days really pissy. And he had the heart of gold. I love my father. But like any father, we have our faults. Um, anyone who tells you they don't is full of shit. Pardon. Sorry, sorry, sorry about the swear word. Um, we, we have our faults. The question is how many and are we cognizant and we try and fix them and are we getting better? But I remember he'd come home in some pretty shitty moods. Not be abusive, but just be shut down and not be himself. Yes, he has accountability to his behavior, but work caused that. So imagine if we can change that. Like imagine if, if we can change how we lead, if we can really change mental health in this country. So talk to you a little bit about what's, this is the meat of the book. And, I, and, I, and I'll go through this quickly because I shared quite a bit of it when we talked two years ago. Um, but in the book, I talk about the five anchors of servant leadership. So these are the things you can do on a regular basis to serve people, understand their gaps, help them close them, help them learn, help them grow. This is the structure you can put in place. You're always gonna need key performance indicators, KPIs, to measure whether those behaviors that you're working on are working so we can validate that it's good for the business. But you want to coach the behaviors that cause the result. The five key pillars that I talk about all the time, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. I'll do a quick review of this so we stay on time. The connection meeting. How do you lead someone if you don't know who they are? How in the world do you have a one-on-one -on -one and expect an employee to trust you if they don't feel like you know who they are and what they value? So before you start one-on-ones, I always have a connection meeting. I ask really simple questions. And again, they're in the book. Uh, I'm really sounding like that cheesy author trying to push his book, aren't I? I'll stop that. But they are in the book. Available now on Amazon. Okay. Um, the five things, connection meeting, I ask five simple questions. Tell me about your past. Because what I want the employee to know is I, I, I see the value they're bringing into the organization. And we often don't talk about that. And we assume they know how to do today's job. And had we had asked questions, we know they have all these other talents that they want to use and we could be leveraging. So, so what does your career path look like today? What do you think the expectations of your new job are in the company? Whether you got promoted or you just got brought in. So you have that opportunity, if they think they're coming in, to do sales. <clears throat> so as an example of Fusion Homes, uh, we had our own in-house sales staff, but they also had to do all the administration of the contract. The inquiries in and out of the office, it was really hard. They didn't just sell, they did the administration. Well, resetting that to say, well, I'm coming in, I'm going to sell some houses and I'm going to pass it off because I was a realtor. I get it. No, hold on. <laughs> we should talk a little deeper about this. Maybe we didn't do a good job in the interview, but here's what 
um, submit to offices. Here's what is a request for upgrades outside the program. Here's what um, customized floor plan. And so you've got an opportunity to set the expectations in the role so they know what they're gonna be held accountable to. And then I ask what I think is the most important question of all of them. Tell me what a good leader looks like and tell me what a bad leader looks like. Because what I wanna do is I wanna avoid the behaviors that have pissed this person off in the past, which is the reason they're with us today. And I wanna repeat the behaviors that really puts them in a sweet spot. So what does a good and bad leader look like to you? And then the last quick two things that I do, I talk about, tell me about personal life if you're willing. So I don't wanna step on any sacred cows. Are you a runner and the running club's Thursday night at 5.30? And although the workday ends at five, sometimes shit happens and we need people to stay. I'm gonna protect that Thursday 5.30. You would be surprised how, many, how much one little thing could cause a great employee to leave your company. Be cognizant of the major ones. And then I talk about where do you wanna go and how do I help you get there? What does the future look like? And that starts to lead me down the track of development with them. The weekly one-on-one, -on -one, I won't go into deep detail with. You sit down with your team every week. You find out what they did the week before because you're not going to see them every minute of the day. You find out if you were there, what would they have wanted help with? You close that gap. You mm -hmm. recognize what they've done really well. You talk about the next seven days and, and how do I help you avoid anything that's coming your way? Are you worried about priorities? Are you worried about skills to do the job and hit the expectations? Is there a knowledge gap that I need to close with you? I'm also during that time looking for recognition that I want to put into the performance review. Because for those of you who don't do performance reviews, um, if you think your employees are okay with it, they're really not. They're just not telling you. Um, and if they are, it's because they've had shitty performance reviews in their past. And the way you write a good performance review is you track high level areas of recognition and themes of development as it happens. So when you get to write your performance review at the end of the year, the content's in all those weekly one-on-ones. And you shouldn't have 52 weeks of feedback in those boxes. You should have five tremendous over-the-top things, and you can reference the week it happened and what it was. And that's how people repeat behaviors. The other reason people don't want performance reviews is we go, here's a self-evaluation. Submit it to me by your review time. And then we copy and paste it. Do we think our people are done? Could we insult them any more than by saying, write a self-evaluation and I'm going to copy and paste it and tell you that you did a good job because you think you did? Because it's easier for me to get through the process. So the one-on-one -on -one gives you the confidence as a leader to have that content and add value. Coaching during the game, I shared the example earlier. Get on the sales center during a launch if you're the president or CEO. Watch the hurdles that are in place that you know you can take away and fix the process to make it easier on your team and your customer. Pick up the broom. The guys at Dunsire knew I didn't know. I didn't grow up on the tools. I acknowledged it right away. So I'd always walk onto site and say, tell me the shitty job that even I can't screw up. Here's the broom, go sweep the foundation. Got it. Two things. One, they were realizing I acknowledged my own faults and I was human. I got it. Two, now there's empathy. Now they know I know what it's like to hold that friggin' broom in the foundation. And then I take away a win if I can. My guys didn't have uniforms. There's no branded apparel, yet here I am. I'm dust covered in Guelph, learning what they do. And I come back and say, guys, cleaning those clothes has to be a disaster. So I'm getting you all five shirts each. I'm getting you two jackets each. And, we're and so you learn and you can change the process by coaching during the game. Um, the PDS I talked about earlier, um, make sure you build that development strategy for your team. Do it every three months for your highly promotables. Identify where they want to go, identify the gaps, put the learning opportunity against it. Um, and then the performance review that I went into quite, quite deeply just before. If you have the content and you take the time to write a proper employee, employee sorry, performance review, it's going to help you tie compensation to it properly. It's going to be very specific so behaviors get repeated and the ones that aren't getting done get corrected and you're going to build trust with your employee versus losing trust because you're either not doing them and giving them feedback so they don't know how they're getting a raise or not getting a raise they don't know they're standing or you're going to lose trust because they're going to go I wrote that for you and you added five words I do like self-evaluations to be clear what I do is I have the employee write it I write the review they bring their self-evaluation to review day and then I give them their review and then we go through their self-evaluation and then what we do is close any gaps. Hey, you think you did really good at this, but I didn't recognize it. And I'll either change the review because I missed it 
or I'll get them to buy in that they're not as strong as what they thought they were on that. And I'll show them the feedback from the one-on-one -on -one to justify it. And that's the way you build more trust through a self-evaluation. Okay. If you master two things in your career that will help you grow and help you grow others, make it these two, inquiry versus advocacy. Okay. And it applies to everything. It applies to your career. It applies to leadership. It applies to sales. It applies to your relationships. Inquiry versus advocacy. What we do as leaders normally is we advocate. We don't do any inquiry. We just tell you how we want it. Do this and you'll be fine. Inquiry allows people to learn and get to that decision on their own, or even better, make a better decision. And so it's a balance. It's how many questions do you ask that are open-ended to get someone to the answer. You either want to advocate or you can advocate together. Think about your relationships. I, I coach and train all this stuff and I come home, my wife says bullshit because you don't do it at home. <laughs> I, I get an opinion. I want everyone to know my opinion at home. Kids, go to bed. It's time. It's 8.05. I don't practice this stuff at home. And, and if I did, my relationship would be even better than it is. My wife goes, oh, you're much more understanding. I'm glad that we talked about that a little longer. I'm your typical male. We have a conflict. I walk away. Let's talk about it in nine weeks and I hope you forget. But inquiry versus advocacy, when you ask open-ended questions, you can get people together faster. So leadership, sales, home life. Sales is even better. Like we, well, I had to reset sales behaviors with that team at Fusion. Customer would walk in and the first question would be, you want a three bedroom or a four bedroom? Here's what we have available. You want lot 27 or lot 39? Well, hold on. That customer is going to buy that home, that lot, and then they're going to realize once they move in, it doesn't solve the functional and emotional needs they have in their life. So I taught that team how to sell on inquiry and then advocate the lot and the home. Ask the proper open-ended questions so we get the customer all the way through the seven-year cycle. So when their seven-year warranty is up with Terion, they we understand their expectations on after-sales service. We understand how they do parties in the backyard in the summer. We understand that they are going to have grandma over for the winter months because it's cold in the home, old person's home, and she's going to stay with them. So we've recommended finishing a basement and why. We've re recommended an extra deep lot that we normally would have just said, okay, you need a four bedroom. It's available on lot 37 and it's only $5.99. And so that inquiry versus advocacy makes it even easier to close the sale and develop people because you've brought them along the inquiry cycle. Last one, willingness versus knowledge. Always be willing to close your learning gaps as you pursue your goals and always take ownership to identify and close the gaps of people you lead. I always say, if you have a willing employee, everything's possible. If it's just a knowledge gap and you can identify it, that's how people grow. You can build a team. It's on you as a leader to help them get there through this process that I mentioned earlier. If you have a willingness gap, that's where Mark Pettibaugh fires people. And you rarely hear me talk about it because it's always terrible because I know how they feel when they go home. And I've just sent home a father or mother with no revenue and it kills me. But I've also done all these steps and the things holding us back is you're choosing not to do it. I can't help you with that. So if you want to grow your career, always be open to gathering more knowledge. Be willing. And when you're leading people, if you've got someone who wants to learn and is willing and their only deficiencies are knowledge, fill that bucket. That's your job as a servant leader. Whew. This is my first Zoom keynote. I think I did okay, but I'm out of Bailey's. So no, I'm teasing. I'm not drinking Bailey's. Um, John Anthony or Cindy or Charles, I'll pass it over to you to maybe organize questions if anyone has any. Sure, Mark. Thanks. Thank you very much. There's so much great stuff to unpack there. But before, um, before we get into uh, exchanging pleasantries, as we said, guys, if um, anybody has any questions uh, uh, for Mark, um, feel free to either um, kind of uh, raise your hand and speak up or you can type them into the chat and I'd be happy to relay that for the group here. So we'll open up the floor to our, to our group here. Maybe to get stuff started, um, I have a question, Mark, relating to, uh, to your presentation. Now, um, did I lose everybody with the Habs fan thing? Let's just be honest. <laughs> Not at all. Now, like I said, I'll, I got a question for you, Mark. Now, now for those of us um, that might be too scared or too afraid to kind of show chinks in the armor, to ask for help from their superiors or ask for uh, leadership about something that um, maybe a, a portion of, of their work that they know nothing about, 
how does one kind of walk that tightrope, balance that, um, you know, nature versus nurture type of thing? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because I, I certainly have a lot of functional gaps in roles I've started in through my career. And the way I always approach it is I be transparent about the end goal and I demonstrate my ability to learn. So as an example, you know, if I, I took on when I interviewed for Lee for VP of sales at Fusion Homes, I'd never been in the home building industry. I'd sold t-shirts and beer and worked in pro sports and printing before. In the interview, I set the stage like, hey, listen, here are the transferable Referable behaviors. I can build you a sales program when I understand how you sell a home and I can do it differently than anyone else. Where I'm going to need your support is teach me the functional stuff. I will take it home till midnight if I have to. I will learn what an agreement of purchase and sale is versus a $19.99 t-shirt transaction at the till, but I need your support so I can deliver what you expect. If you make it comfortable for them to be open that you don't know by committing to how you're going to close the knowledge gap, you'll find most people want to help you. So make sure you tie in your accountability to doing something with their knowledge. It's an excellent point. I think that's something that all of us uh, that just followed your presentation could, uh, could certainly learn from, certainly. Um, any, anybody else, guys? Like I said, we can uh, open the chat, or if you'd want to come on camera, we can certainly arrange for that. Mark, I, I have a follow-up uh, question. Uh, further to the previous one, uh, what are your thoughts on vulnerability? Um, John Anthony's question was kind of about uh, employee to leader, but even especially for the leader to employees as a CF servant leader, you know, a lot of, a lot of us have been taught to, you know, we're expected to be powerful or expected to always know the answers, str show strength and everything like, like, like that. But in the servant leadership, I think it's okay to show weaknesses. It's, it's okay to ask help. So what are your thoughts on vulnerability and especially as, as leaders? Yeah, it's, it's, first of all, great question, Charles. And it's, it's a fine balance because I know what the risk, like, let's put it this way. If I went into a boardroom in Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment and cried every second day, I wouldn't have been there very long. But, but there were days where I literally felt like crying, right? <laughs> um, I would say the way I gauge when I can be vulnerable and how is I've got to read the room and does it connect us? If it connects us because this is something someone else would feel, I, I'm a little more open. I'm a little more vulnerable. But if I'm like, like, let's say I was CEO of MLSE and I went into the boardroom with, you know, the CEO of Rogers and the CEO of Bell, Bruce Cope, who I actually worked for at TELUS before he was at Bell. So I'm sharing a bad example because he's a great dude. And, and Larry Tannenbaum, if I read that room of stuffy suits and thought if I show any weakness, I might hold my vulnerability. Um, I try and pick it for audiences that I can trust that, and, and sit subjects that you know everyone would empathize with. Like, be okay with that. And, and it is a fine balance. I know that's kind of a crappy answer. And the reason it sounds soft is because I'm the reverse. I'm way too vulnerable all the time. So I don't want to give everybody that guidance. Um, but kind of find yourself halfway. If, if you know you can trust your audience, if you know 99 out of 100 people would empathize, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. I, and, I'll, and I'll leave it with this, this question is, look at the examples of leaders we have in the world. Okay, and I'm not getting into politics. So whether you like Trudeau or like Ford or like Trump, I'm, I'm just not going there today. Um, but what I would tell you is regardless, we have a lack of trust with a lot of those individuals. And I would tell you it's because none of them have ever admitted they're wrong. None of them have ever been able to connect with us as human beings, so we can't trust them because we've not seen that behavior. So there's a great power in vulnerability when it's sincere and authentic of connecting people. So let that be your guide. There's not a, a yes or no answer. That makes great a lot stuff. of sense. Thanks, Mark. Great stuff there. We do have some more questions pulling in, so I'm going to go in order here. From Chris Hutchins, uh, not a question, more so a comment from Brand Haven Holmes. I uh, just wanted to share, Mark, that he found today extremely insightful and uh, really enjoyed the presentation, and he sent congratulations on the book. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Now, uh, our next question from Melissa Morledge is, do you have any advice on how to prioritize valuable feedback to an individual on your team? An example being, if there's a lot, uh, a lot to work on, how do you determine the best place to start? Yeah, great question. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Um, I always do the high impact payoff. So if I've got like seven things that I've observed that need correcting and I'm in a weekly one-on-one -on -one when I'm giving them to them and I one don't have time to give all of them in an hour or um, 
I don't want to overwhelm them. I pick the high impact items first that are easiest to change because then the employee can walk away, change the behavior quickly, but also generate the result faster. So that's usually how I prioritize deficiencies. Hope that helped. Nice. Rob, I apologize. Our, uh, our past president, I skipped over you. Did you have a question that you wanted to put forward? Yes, I do. Hi, Mark. Great. Hi, Rob. That was great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Thanks for sharing all your stories and all your, yeah, all your great knowledge. Um, you mentioned that. unwilling employees or closed-minded employees. Do you have an example of how you uh, made them more willing or more open-minded? Do you have an example, like one example of that? Yeah, I, I, and I, I won't name names, but I, but I had a lady at uh, one of my past companies uh, who was on my sales team. Um, and she was a high gun success, you know, results. She, she got the numbers. Um, but, you know, at that company, we did two customer surveys a year. And what people were talking about was a negative experience. Like I felt rushed. I had to get my paperwork in. I had to, you know, they were, they were rude until it was time to buy an upgrade. So she was your stereotypical, always be closing salesperson, right? And I had to get her to value the experience at the same time as the financial result. Um, so I just literally brought in the customer service feedback because it's easier to accept knowledge gaps when there's fact. And so I didn't say, Gene at lot 137 at Salterra says, I said, here's some feedback from our customers, kept the customer anonymous. And the first thing that shows up is denial and then emotion. Well, no, no, they saw it wrong. And I said, well, hold on, there's a sample set here. This is at one customer. Here's the theme that's growing over five people. Um, and then I let her cry. She, she had to get it out because here's her boss calling around on the behavior. And then I close the gap. How do we correct it and how do I support you? And that individual went on to not only have the top selling sales community in the company and the highest upgrades as a percentage, she also had the highest customer satisfaction scores in the history of the company for that community. So that was a great example. On the downside, Rob, there's been issues where I do all that and the employees still, they're being rude. Um, and that's when the willingness versus knowledge comes in and you got to make a tough business decision because it isn't aligned with your corporate values. You're getting the result, but you're not treating our customer well. I've taken it from coaching to like performance management, verbal warning, written warning. It's time to go and I got to part ways. So it usually ends one of the two ways. Good stuff, man. We're going to uh, work our way down um, from Zachary Page, our dear friend from Meridian. He asks, as someone who is not yet a people leader, what do you think is the most important thing one can do to get their own leader to be a servant leader? Ah, what a great question. And if I had that answer, it would be in the book um, <laughs> that I'd make you buy. It's available on, no. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think the only thing you can do where, where I've found value is, is be open with who you are and like feedback. You go first, be vulnerable. So I'll use this story of Lee, if anyone knows Lee at Fusion. Lee's brilliant. He is like the greatest strategic mind I think I've ever worked with. Um, and because he's got a process in place, it's like, we got to do this. And he's super approachable and a nice guy, but it wasn't meshing with the way I like to be led from a CEO. So I asked him, I said, can we go grab a drink after work? I said, you know, I think I can improve even further my performance, but, but I want to talk to you about where I need your support. And in that dialogue, all I did was talk to Lee about who I was as a person and how I like to be communicated with. And it changed the relationship a little bit. So my guidance would be you go first. And then if you deal with someone who says too friggin' bad, do it my way or the highway, at least you know what you got and it's in front of you. Sorry, Zach, if that wasn't a great answer, but it's, it's the only experience one I could have. And if I had an answer, there'd be nothing but servant leaders in the world. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, we just have another comment from uh, Leisha Lynn. I hope I'm reading that right. Yeah. Uh, she just comments that it's always inspiring to listen to you, Mark, and uh, to congratulate you on the book and that she can't wait to read it. That actually ties in. Actually, so we were talking with Mark uh, before the presentation started, and he. I want to let our group know, uh, everybody who's, uh, who's here, that Mark very graciously has, um, has offered to uh, donate a copy of his book um, uh, when um, coming up very shortly. So um, uh, like you, Alicia, I am very excited to read it. Mark is always an incredibly engaging guy. This uh, shows a prime example as to why. And um, so thank you, Mark, very much for that. Oh, no worries. Yeah, Mark, we, uh, so Mark, Mark has actually offered to donate copies of the book to everybody 
on uh, this event today. Um, he'll be sending it to um, the WeHBA office, and then we'll figure out uh, how to deliver that to everybody. So thank you again, Mark. Very, very generous of you. Yeah, you're welcome. It should be ready. Um... <laughs> I'm self-publishing, so getting it on Amazon has been a disaster. Like the Kindle version is available now, by the way, for $5.10 for anyone who wants it. But the paperback that I'll be getting you uh, is hopefully going to be available this Saturday. And I'll, I'll order a bunch of copies, get them to me, and then I'll get them to Cindy and the team over at the association. Great. Do we have uh, any further questions, guys? I think we've gone through everything in the chat. Um, anything else we can uh, bring forward before we uh, kind of say our goodbyes here? Yeah, I have a question. Um, Mark, you touched on the, the knowledge gap versus the willingness gap. What are some ways you can identify that? Um, maybe some examples just so you know how best to be a, that servant leader. Yeah, so to do that, you got to set goalposts, right? So Anthony, just to be clear, is, is it relative to finding out one of your team members' gaps or your gaps to grow your career? Sorry, I have to bring it back on. A team, a team member. A team member. Yeah, so, so figure the, the first thing I always do with the personal development strategy is, is, is really two things, the first thing. One is it doesn't get into a performance review. So there's no accountability. Whether the employee does it or not, it's their plan. You're there to provide guidance and resources. And so what I do is I tell the employee, well, okay, so come back to me. Where do you want to go? And, and where do you think you're deficient? And how do we help? And so you start by saying, okay, here's where I'm at today. And I want to be the director. Or I want to be the manager. Or I want to be in this department. And it's a lateral move. It's not even a promotion. And now the employee comes back to you and says, I think I need to learn the following things. And then you build on it as their leader. Okay, well, I have a little more insight to this. And you put in management that you got to know the KPIs and the numbers. But you didn't talk about coaching behavior. So I'm going to get you a training on how to coach people. And, I'm, and that's how you start to fill those gaps. Set your two goalposts. Let the employee go first. Tell you where they want the help, to how to get there. And then you add in the filler. I hope that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, kind of is, is that it for questions? I believe it is. One comment, go leaves go from Rob. <laughs> oh, Rob, there you go. Correct. I will, I will leave you with this <laughs> hockey related. I grew up in Montreal. The Habs fan yeah, love comes from there. When I worked for MLSE for five years, I can tell you this. I really do hope they win a cup if it's not Montreal, because there is no one more loyal than maybe a Cubs fan than a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. So you deserve it. Mark, I want to thank you for uh, such an interesting, inspiring talk. I uh, really appreciate you uh, joining the committee this morning. Uh, the, the, the cover shot on the book looks fantastic. So you must be, uh, must be happy with that. And uh, um, I actually also worked for Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment uh, a long time ago. Um, different department. It was just an usher at the events. But uh, what a great organization to work for. So when was that? Sorry. Uh, I was there from 1999 till 2009 as part of the uh, event staff. Uh, okay. So, got so you knew, I... did you know Brendan Costigan? Uh, vaguely, yeah. He was the director. Uh, Ryan May was one of the supervisors. Kevin Kempke, any of those guys? In the ring yeah, I know Kevin, yeah. He's now with the Raiders as their VP of uh, security. He's in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, it was, uh, it's definitely an interesting organization to work for, uh, especially through the Vince Carter era. Um, absolutely loved it, and um, the live shows were great as well. It wasn't it. Awesome. Well, hey, pleasure, pleasure. I guess, e-meeting you somewhere. I can't even see you on the thumbnail on the screen, so you'll have to take my apologies for that. Okay, guys, you know what? If, um, if it's okay with everybody, Mark, on behalf of myself, um, um, the rest of our and the rest of our committee members for the U40 Young Professional Group, thank you so much for joining us. I was joking with you earlier that uh, Mark, at least in the U40 uh, circles, have become a bit of a cult hit thanks to these uh, these fantastic presentations. And um, whether this was the first time you heard Mark speak, your second time, um, I think you'd all agree that he did a sensational job. And uh, certainly we're very lucky to have, um, to have had that for our group here. So Mark, thank you very much. Uh, you're more than welcome. It's my pleasure. Stay safe, everybody. Life is short. Enjoy every moment. Keep it that simple. Great, great. Everybody, uh, on behalf of um, the U40 committee itself and the West End Home Builders Association, we thank you so much. We had, I think, 40 people in here at its peak, which is excellent. 
uh, makes us really happy. And um, stay tuned for um, for our next coming events. Obviously, uh, we're at a kind of a critical time as it relates to COVID. So stay on top of our social and our website for news on upcoming events as they unfold. In the meantime, please continue to stay safe, look after each other, and we thank you very much.